Our recording. Ready to roll. All right. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining. We'll give folks just a moment to log on. We're excited to have so many people joining from across the state today. So just bear with us for one moment as I see a couple of people still setting up their audio, and we'll get started in just a moment. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the webinar, Declaring Racism, a Public Health Crisis in Virginia. This is the first webinar of a series called Racism is a Public Health Crisis that will explore the background, context, and future of Virginia's recent resolution declaring racism a public health crisis in the Commonwealth. This webinar series is sponsored by the Institute for Public Health Innovation, Voices for Virginia's Children, the Virginia Public Health Association, and Virginia Tech Public Health in the Department of Population Health Sciences and the Virginia Tech College of Veterinary Medicine. We'll be, we will begin the presentation with a diversity welcome led by Chloe Edwards. Hi everyone, my name is Chloe Edwards with Voices for Virginia's Children. We're going to first start off this uh, webinar by setting the tone and creating a space for everyone that's inclusive. Our goal with each webinar in this series is to intentionally create an inclusive space where we all have a sense of belonging, regardless of our unseen or seen identities. We'll start off with what we call a diversity welcome to help us get an idea of what shapes the perspectives and experiences of each panelist, and we'll affirm those identities wel are welcome here today. So I'll start off with an example and pass the mic. My name is Chloe Edwards. I identify as a cis Black woman. I have lived experience of Virginia's child welfare system, adversity, and trauma. Thank you for welcoming me here today, and I'll pass the mic back to Rebecca. Thank you, Chloe. Um, it's an honor to be with everyone today. My name is Rebecca Epstein. I identify as a cisgendered white woman. I come from a background of a middle-class family growing up outside D.C., I'm excited to be here with you all today to explore this very important topic. And I will pass the mic to Kim. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Kim Baskett. I am president-elect of the Virginia Public Health Association and serve on the steering committee on, on, for Immunized VA, as well as chair the outreach and education work group. Um, I grew up in a middle-class um, blue-collar family. I was born in Portsmouth, Virginia, and lived there till third grade and was uh, lived in Chesapeake, Virginia after that. And I welcome everybody. All right, so we are glad to have you on the webinar with us this afternoon. We did have a, we have just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Everyone will be muted through the presentation. If you have questions for the speakers, please put them in the Q&A box, which can be found in the toolbar at the top or bottom of your screen. Some of our presenters are not able to join us for the entirety of the webinar, so we will answer a few questions after their presentations. Other questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar. We have a full agenda with a number of wonderful speakers today. We will kick things off with Mike Royster, the Senior Vice President at the Institute for Public Health Innovation. Next, we'll hear from De Delegate LaCherise Ayrd, the patron of the resolution declaring public health a crisis in Virginia. We'll also have the opportunity to hear from Cynthia Hudson, the chair of the commission to examine racial in inequity in Virginia law, retaining this commission as referenced in the resolution. Our final presentation will provide an overview of next steps for advocates, including tips for introductions, similar, similar resolutions at a local level. Chloe Edwards, policy analyst at Voices for Virginia's Children and Councilwoman Tina Stevens from Stevens City, Virginia will deliver this presentation. We'll conclude this, uh, the, the webinar with Q&A. Thank you, Kim. And I'm pleased to introduce my esteemed colleague, Dr. Mike Royster. He is the Senior Vice President at the Institute for Public Health Innovation. Prior to joining IPHI, Mike was the Director of the Virginia Department of Health Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. 
In this position, he oversaw Virginia's state offices of minority health, rural health, and primary care. He worked to advance health equity by developing data tools such as the Health Opportunity Index to assess, assess health inequities, improving access to quality health care and providers, developing and promoting community-based participatory initiatives, enhancing the capacity of VDH and its partners to promote health equity, and facilitating health strategies to target the social determinants of health. Prior to this position, Dr. Royster was the director of the Crater Health District headquartered in Petersburg, Virginia. In this capacity, he oversaw public health programs and services for five rural counties and three small cities with a combined population of 150,000. Among other initiatives, he led the initial implementation of emergency preparedness and response planning within the district, implemented outcome-based program evaluation for all health departments, and led the expansion of community-based participatory efforts to promote cardiovascular health, eliminate childhood lead poisoning, and reduce teen pregnancy. Mike is a board certified public health and general preventative medicine and general preventative medicine doctor. He is a fellow of the American College of Preventative Medicine. He is also a member of the American Public Health Association and past president of the Virginia Public Health Association. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks everybody. I'm excited to be here and excited to see the level of interest in this webinar. Um, in addition to uh, what Rebecca had to say, I would just also um, mention that I identify as a cisgender black man, a father and a husband, as well as a public health physician who's committed to racial health and social justice. For my uh, time this morning this, or this afternoon, I wanna kind of paint the picture and, and give context to this idea of declaring racism a public health crisis. And so on the first slide, um, we'll begin a discussion by defining what a public health crisis is. Uh, Dr. Sandro Galea, the Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health defines a public health crisis according to three criteria. The first is that the problem must affect large numbers of people. The second is that it must threaten health over the long term. And finally, it must require the adoption of long, large scale solutions. So with these criteria in mind, let's see how well racism fits that definition. On the next slide, so in order to do so, we first wanna make sure we have an understanding of what racism is. And so for that, we turn to Dr. Kamara Jones who spent her professional career studying the impact of racism on health. And she defines racism, as you can see here on the slide, that it's a system of structures, policies, practices, and norms that assigns value based on what people look like. It disadvantages people of color, it advantages whites, and ultimately undermines the realization of the full potential of our society. It's important to note that while science has clearly shown that race is not genetically or biologically real, Dr. Jones' definition notes that race has become real in a social and societal context. In, the terms, of the, in terms of the value we place on people of different racial backgrounds, in particular, the value placed on whiteness relative to people in communities of color and the resulting distribution of society's resources, opportunities, and burdens across those lines. On the next slide, um, we to, to further understand the public health significance of racism, it's really important to, to explore the system of racism and its structural components. And as we think about it, um, structural racism can be thought of as occurring across four interconnected and mutually reinforcing levels personal, interpersonal, institutional, and cultural. And so without an understanding of all of these levels, people have a tendency to get stuck talking only about the personal and the interpersonal, and then they miss the forest for the trees. It's also important to note that racism intersects with other forms of oppression, such as gender, social class, LGBTQIA identity, level of ability, et cetera to ultimately amplify the oppression that many may experience. Racism as a system is also used as a wedge to divide groups of people who otherwise share common concerns, such as the economic inequities that many poor and working class whites and people of color experience. And so with that in mind, let's look at these levels in even more detail. 
On the next slide, um, the personal level, which relates to the values, beliefs, and feelings of an individual regarding the superiority or inferiority of their own or other, other racial groups. And next slide, the interpersonal actions that relate to these beliefs are important aspects of racism. We say, see them in the white racist attack and murder of Ahmaud Arbery in Georgia last year, and the murder and physical, I'm sorry, the mass murder and physical and verbal assaults among Asian Americans that have increased in recent months. We could also note the, the police killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and many others. But outside of these extreme and horrific events, we also see daily examples of interpersonal racism in the explicit and implicit bias that leads um, some healthcare providers to prescribe pain medicine to Black and Latinx patients in the ER less often than white patients with the same symptoms. And we've seen that show up in, in multiple research studies. We've also seen examples where school administrators um, are more likely to suspend or expel students of color than white students who've committed the same infraction. In addition, research also shows us that individuals who report experiencing interpersonal racism are more likely to engage in unhealthy behaviors themselves, such as smoking, drinking, abuse of other substances, and violence. The next level of racism that, again, we often don't see, but is clearly there, is institutional racism, which refers to the laws, policies, and practices within and across organizations, institutions, and society that intentionally or not produce outcomes that favor whites and put people of color at a disadvantage. Institutions within and across our society consistently produce racially inequitable outcomes. For example, we could think of school funding and disciplinary practices that are racially inequitable, as well as public health and healthcare services and research, housing segregation and discrimination, disproportionate police killing of people of color. And even you know, in the last few days, we've seen even additional examples with Dante Walker and a young 13 year old who was killed, I believe yesterday. We also see mass incarceration, employment discrimination, banking and finance that lead to people of color being more likely to, to be given subprime mortgage loans regardless of their credit score, as well as underinvestment in communities of color. The food system and food deserts, current voter suppression legislation, inequitable transportation systems that result in lack of access to jobs, health care, education in many communities of color, as well as the locating of bus depots and highways in communities of color that break up the community context, the social fabric, as well as, as, as exposed to um, air pollution and other toxins. And we can think about these and many other systems in our, or institutions in our society that result in the inequitable distribution of social determinants of health in the places where we live, learn, work, and play that ultimately uh, impact our opportunities to be healthy as well as the exposures that undermine our health. On the next slide, the glue that holds all of this together is the cultural level of racism, which reinforces the notion of the superiority of whiteness, which can also be thought of uh, or is referred to as white supremacy culture at the individual, organizational, and institutional levels. It does this by establishing and reinforcing society's shared values and priorities through marketing and media representations, music, organizational and institutional norms, who, who we identify as our heroes and their monuments, and many other cultural factors and cues. Next slide. Ultimately, the system of racism not only shapes, but also reinforces the distribution of social determinants of health over time and across generations. And this slide reminds us of some of the key points about social determinants of health. In particular, their distribution is responsible for most health inequities that we see in, in Virginia and across the country. Social determinants of health influence 
um, health through their impact on individuals' access to health care, whether it's through jobs or being able to afford um, health care independently. Uh, people's ability to engage in healthy behaviors based on where they can afford to live and what they can afford to purchase for health, as well as the exposures to environmental threats, such as lead in drinking water or violence in communities, and the physiological and psychological effects of toxic stress related to uh, navigating our daily lives, often with limited access to resources, as well as facing social exclusion and marginalization. Also important is that social determinants of health are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources through their influence on policy decisions across all, aspects, all, all sectors and institutions in our society. Next slide, I, I want to you know, really focus in a little bit on the idea of toxic stress um, associated with both navigating adverse social determinants of health as well as the anticipation of and experiences of interpersonal racism and the social exclusion at the cultural level that I just described. This toxic stress actually serves as a common pathway whereby structural racism impacts health by causing an overactivation of the body's fight or flight response with the release of adrenaline and stress hormones and having a, a significant impact on physical and mental health, as you can see here in the slide. These and other um, health challenges are related to toxic stress. There's also evidence that ongoing stress of racial trauma can cause epigenetic changes in our genes, which result in certain genes being turned on and others off that ultimately increase our risk for chronic diseases. And these changes can be transmitted across generations. So let's shift gears for a moment now and look at a few data points from Virginia to reinforce the impact of structural racism on social determinants in communities of color. On this slide, we see the elevated prevalence of childhood poverty by race and ethnicity with black children in blue at 26%, Hispanic children in yellow at 18%, American Indian children in green at 15%, and those identifying as two or more races in purple at 13%. Again, the history of residential racial, racial segregation, job discrimination, educational and health inequities lead to higher rates of poverty among children and families of color and the associated mental and physical health implications. On the next slide, we'll see, we I'm sure will not be surprised that many children that grow up in poverty also live in families that experience housing instability. And in Virginia, um, Families with children who have little or no confidence in their ability to pay their next rent or mortgage payment are disproportionately likely to be Hispanic in blue, Black in red, and Asian in green. And so again, the stress related to the health related uh, barriers and stress associated with housing instability disproportionately affect children and families of color. On this slide, the next slide, I'm sorry, we also see data on school suspensions. Um, and, and how that intersects the interpersonal in, implicit bias and institutional racism in our school settings, where Black children are three times more likely to be suspended than their white peers, although they do not commit um, offenses at a higher rate. And so the long-term implications that I'm sure we're familiar with are um, academic failure, mental health problems, substance abuse, gang activity, and justice system involvement all of which affect life opportunities and health outcomes. And in fact, educational attainment is one of the most consistent predictors of health across the world. On the next slide, we turn to looking at some of the health inequities that not surprisingly result from these, uh, these social determinants. And given the time, I'll, I'll um, kind of just walk us through these um, briefly, but we see clearly the impact of the social determinants on um, low birth weight, which is one of the main um, indicators, not only of prenatal care, but also maternal health and the overall well being of communities. And we see that Black in infants are twice as likely to be born low birth weight with increased risk for Asian and Latinx as well. And with our understanding of the inter interaction of structural racism, we can clearly see the various factors that relate 
to these adverse outcomes. On the next slide, we finally return to COVID-19 pandemic, which shows the significantly increased risk of death from COVID among Hispanic and, and Black Virginians. And again, these inequities are directly related to the historic and present day effects of structural racism uh, related to um, employment, housing, and educational discrimination, which means that many people of color are more likely to be represented in essential jobs that require them to be exposed, uh, place them at a greater risk for being exposed to COVID. Um, we also know that the historical context of social determinants and stress places communities of color at greater risk for having chronic diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, and cancer that all also increase the risk for COVID. And then finally, the distrust, implicit bias, and limited access to culturally and linguistically appropriate services, um, both to manage health conditions, as well as um, the limited access to COVID testing, vaccines, and timely treatment all contribute to this inequity. And it's important to note that the CDC just uh, released a report identifying that the life expectancy in the US has dropped by one year as a result of COVID. But among Hispanics, it's dropped by 1.9 years and among African-Americans, 2.7 years, erasing the 10 year gains in life expectancies that, that Blacks have experienced compared to whites. Uh, I'll briefly also mention on the next slide that there are dramatic um, uh, costs to health inequities as well that we all bear, and that these costs could be thought of as um, opportunity costs that could otherwise be um, channeled towards building a thriving society for all if we were to address the under underlying structural racism that causes these inequities. So returning briefly to Dr. Um, Galeo's criteria for public health crisis, I think we can clearly see that one, the problem um, affects large numbers of people. 30% of our residents in Virginia are people of color, over 2.5 million people. Uh, the problem must threaten health over the long term. We know that these inequities have been longstanding, and we know that when new health threats occur, such as COVID or Hurricane Katrina, they disproportionately affect people of color. And the problem must require the adoption of large scale solutions. And because of the structure, because structural racism is rooted in our collective history and continues through the current levels of racism, it will require broad, large-scale solutions across all aspects of our society. So finally, it's clear that racism is a public health crisis in Virginia. And this is re also reinforced by recent statements by our new um, director of the CDC, who reinforces that this is a critical public health issue that we all must work together to address. And so with that, I'll turn it over to our guest speakers who will talk to us more specifically about what Virginia is doing and what, and also what we can do collectively uh, to build on the generations of work that people of color have, have been in, engaged in to address uh, racial injustice in order so that we can create a commonwealth that promotes the health and well-being of all of its residents. Thank you. Rebecca. Thank you, Mike, um, for that great presentation and providing an understanding of racism and how it fits into the criteria of a public health crisis. It was very informative. Um, I'm going to, before I turn it over to Delegate Aird, I'm actually going to turn the mic over real quick to Ben, who was a number, another member of our planning team who um, allow him to introduce himself real quick. So Ben, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Kim, and thanks, Mike, as well. Um, so real briefly, yes, my name is Ben Barber. And uh, I identify as a cisgender white male, also grew up like Rebecca in a middle class family in the suburbs, and just so thrilled to be here and engage in this important conversation. So, Kim, I'm going to throw it back to you. All righty. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate that. All right. So now we are now pleased to welcome the patron of the resolution declaring racism a public health crisis in Virginia, Delegate LaCherise Aird. Delegate Aird was sworn into her office January 2016 to represent the 63rd House District, which includes all of the city of Petersburg, all of Dinwiddie County, and parts of Chesterfield County. She holds a special distinction of being the youngest woman ever elected to the Virginia House of Delegates. She serves on the General Laws, Health, Welfare, and Institutions and Appropriations Committees. 
Out of sessions, she served on the joint committee, joint subcommittees on tax preferences and local governments and fiscal distress. She was recently appointed to the Virginia Tobacco Region Revitalization Commission, which awards grants that supports job creation, education, and a variety of projects in tobacco dependent communities. In her first two terms, Delegate Aired placed significant emphasis on improving education, workforce development, and economic and social justice. Delegate Aired, we are truly honored to have you here with us today to talk about this resolution. Thank you so much, Kim. I was just hoping you were not gonna keep going on the bio. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Um, again, I'm La Charisse Aird. I a, identify as a cisgendered Black woman, and I am really excited to talk about this resolution. And the reason I'm excited to discuss it is because my lived experience, while not spent from sort of an academic standpoint, studying the effects of racism and our structures and institutions um, on people, you know, I am the daughter of teenage parents. Uh, born in Buffalo, New York. And that um, experience being the daughter of those types of parents in an urban, pretty much impoverished uh, environment, living in Buffalo, living in the projects of Newark uh, prior to getting to Virginia, I mean, it comes with its own set of adverse circumstances. And when I was younger, I can remember vividly not knowing that there was a leader out there, that there were people out there that should care about the things that we were experiencing and the circumstances that we were living through. And the irony of life would have it that I'm now able to take each and every one of those adverse experiences and bring them to the General Assembly and advocate for change in our policy so that those who may be experiencing some of the same things I did previously um, do not have to do so. So today, the comments that I want to make um, relative to the bigger picture with this resolution, plain and simple, is that this is just laying the foundation. When we introduced this resolution, and when it began to be discussed around the state, in my own district, which my largest portion of my district, the city of Petersburg, uh, is predominantly a minority, um, uh, has some of the worst health ratings in the state, uh, just a number of challenges, is flanked by uh, Dinwiddie County, uh, which is predominantly white, um, and on the other side, and that's rural, and on the other side, I have Chesterfield County, and the portions I represent are suburban and rural, I would get comments like, why are you introducing this? This is a do-nothing resolution. It doesn't improve the circumstances. It doesn't have any impacts. And I challenge individuals who believe that, because my mom used to always say, the first part in solving a problem is admitting that you have a problem. And in the Commonwealth, a state where we have had serious racial, a uh, uh, negative racial history, we have not done enough to formally acknowledge that these problems exist on many facets, but more specifically in our structures, systems, and institutions. And as uh, Mr. Royster said in his presentation, and if you look at the vote for this resolution, it's very clear that this resolution was needed because many people think when you hear racism, they think about the act of them as an individual and as a person. They do not think about it as existing within our structures and in our systems. And so this resolution not only opened up the conversation, but it allowed us to lay the groundwork from where do we go from here basically allowing policymakers to partner with the actual practitioners and lay out a path forward. So in the resolution, we started out offering five really specific recommendations because in laying the foundation, we want to see where do we need to go from here and invite this process with the resolution to do so. And so the first recommendation of allowing the Office of Health Equity um, to analyze uh, the intersection between race equity lenses through uh, the work that we have um, at the policy level in the state, like that's a critical first step because that's going to allow them to conduct an assessment that then could inform the next steps that lawmakers will take by way of policy. That could result in different budgetary decisions, that can result in different uh, laws specifically. Um, but what I found in all of the policy measures that I've worked on since being elected in 2016, whether that's through the lenses of education, healthcare, uh, public safety, um, across the board, 
all of them pointed back to the need for this assessment. And so it doesn't matter which category of issues we are working in as a general assembly, they all need to be through the lenses of equity. And so that first recommendation in the resolution is to allow for that assessment to occur. Um, in addition to that, uh, and you'll hear from the amazing chairwoman later, we lay um, the groundwork for asking for a future policy that would make the commission to examine uh, racial equity um, in Virginia law permanent. Because while we're going to be bringing new ideas about how we address racism in our structures and in our system, we also need to continue to do the assessment of what is actively still in our code today that um, is continuing to perpetuate the racism that exists in our systems. And we can't do that if this commission goes away. And then the remaining um, elements of uh, the resolution, the, the three additional recommendations, um, those are not foreign. Uh, and many of the resolutions that you have seen across the country, local, state, and even by the uh, healthcare organizations, uh, this is like baseline um, typical action that needs to take to ensure that we are all operating from the same level of understanding, ensuring that the elected leaders, state staff, and state employees, that they understand and know how to uh, combat implicit bias to ensure that we're all using the same types of words and are clear on what those words mean so that I am not communicating with you in a way that you do not understand. Again, a baseline action that must occur. And then lastly, the broad statement that if we're going to be about this work, if we're going to center our policy making and our governing from a place of understanding that racism exists, that we do so in a way that promotes community engagement, we're inviting in conversation, we're transparent parent about it, because this has to be a holistic approach. I mentioned earlier, look at the vote for this resolution. It was not unanimous. And that means in addition to the policy making, in addition to the assessments, we have to continue to be about the work of changing the hearts and minds of people. There were many legislators who did not support this resolution because number one, they did not agree that it is a crisis and that a problem exists. And then number two, they did not feel as though it is the governing body's responsibility to take this on, even though it is uh, existence in the very systems that we're, we're responsible for governing. And so again, for this resolution, um, not only is it critical for the district I represent, for my own life's experiences, for the needs that exist in the Commonwealth, um, but it is only the foundation and the bare minimum for the steps that we have to take next. Thank you so much for um, that presentation, Delegate Aird. I'm sure others enjoyed hearing about this resolution as much as I have and are excited to see it move forward. We know you're not able to stay on the webinar, so we'll go ahead and take a few questions now. It looks like we're primarily asking for links to the resolution, which we are working on getting um, and making available. That will also be sent after the webinar, as well as a recording and a um, copy of these slides. Again, if you have questions for Delegate Aird, please put them in the um, Q&A and we'll do our best to get through a few of them before she has to jump off. And Delegate Aird, the first question for you, is there a budget allocation that went with this bill? Thank you so much. There was not a uh, funding allocation that went with this because it is a resolution. Um, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, the resolutions are mere policy statements that are not equivalent to uh, like uh, a bill. Um, and so there was no fiscal impact and there was no budget associated with it. And I think um, part of the reason why in my comments, I stated that it's very foundational is because we wanted to have um, very specific ask relative to budget requests. And so to allow the Virginia Department of Health's Office of Health Equity to actually conduct an assessment and be able to come back with very specific recommendations, we want to be able to make sure that any investments of dollars are going specifically towards those needs and not just really applied broad in nature. Wonderful, thank you. Our next question is, what can advocates do to build support for these policy changes? What is the role of white people as advocates? Thank you so much. 
Uh, I would say that's twofold. Number one, I go back to this is a little harder um, than just prescribing to the policy recommendations and the resolution, but there are still many people who do not understand plain and simple that racism exhibit exists in our structures and our systems. Uh, and you know, the presentation that Mike gave at the onset of uh, the program, it really highlights how to explain to someone the difference between the act of being racist as an individual and as a person versus the racism that exists in our institutions and our systems. And until we have that level of understanding, even among our policymakers, um, we are going to struggle with actually executing on the recommendations that come as a result of this resolution and that actually do the work of rectifying the racism that exists. And so relative to what white people can do, number one, uh, if you have um, you know, uh, neighbors, friends, family that don't understand this, having those simple conversations, especially because you know and you understand, they go such a long way. Um, but then otherwise, just continuing to partner with amazing organizations like those on this call and those that have been so instrumental in getting this resolution passed and amplified, uh, that is always uh, welcome and it goes just such a long way. Thank you so much. Our next question is, what is the difference between this resolution and a bill? So a resolution is a uh, broad policy statement. Um, a bill changes the actual law. And so this resolution, it has several recommendations. It will require bills um, that change the law to be introduced in the future uh, to take very specific action. So for example, one of the, um, one of the recommendations includes retaining the commission to examine racial inequity in Virginia law as a permanent com uh, commission. This resolution doesn't innately make this commission permanent. A next step will be for an actual bill to make this commission permanent. I hope that makes sense, but that is an example of why the resolution, it makes the policy statement and it offers the recommendation, but additional action does have to occur. Okay. Wonderful, Great. thank you. And we're still getting a lot of questions about um, how to find the resolution and recordings for this presentation, as well as um, the slides that we had earlier. Yes, we will send all of those things out to folks um, following the webinar to make sure that you have these resources. Um, our next question, do policymakers undergo any cultural competency or humility trainings to further understand the social determinants of health, racism, and the impact of people of color? No, and it's horrible. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that, but no, they are not required to undergo any training, which is why one of the recommendations in this resolution includes making the training requirements uh, because ultimately lawmakers are citizen leaders. We come from all walks of life and we bring our experiences with us. In some instances, as limited as that is, I apologize, but it's the truth. And so um, ultimately this training is necessary. And I think we have seen this more and more. And quite frankly, the vote on this resolution makes that very clear. Uh, and quite frankly, a lot of times I spend my, my days trying to pass policy like this, arguing with other lawmakers. Um, and so the training is necessary, it's mission critical, and is not required at this time, but I hope that it will be one of the follow-up actions that are taken to make it a reality. Wonderful. Um, so we are still getting a few questions. I think we have time for one more. Um, the next question is, thank you for sponsoring this resolution. As a person of color, I am horrified by the recent actions of the Windsor police. What is the plan to engage communities in discussion to inform the bill for later sponsorship? Thank you so much for that question. And first and foremost, I just want to state uh, not only the incident with the, with the Windsor police, but this week alone has been quite triggering. Um, and I can say that because, you know, last night when just one more video of, I'm a mom of a 13 year old and a nine year old, two young black boys. And it seems as though every single day there is one more thing. Um, and so it is a reminder of how critical this resolution is. 
it's a reminder of how critical allowing this resolution to inform other policy categories like criminal justice reform, um, how important that work is. Um, and relative to engaging the community, you know, I think we have a responsibility as a commonwealth to leverage our state agencies to, in, again, invite in that community engagement. But what does that look like per agency? Uh, what does that look like by mandate? Um, can you really do that? I think we have to get creative about the approaches that we take both at the state level as well as the local level. And admittedly, I have to say part of that conversation must include diversifying these very agencies that we're going to be charging uh, with the responsibility of not just um, enacting regulations through an equitable lens, but leading the policy work, um, because that's another problem that exists. How can we charge these entities with doing this work if you don't have diverse representation and leaders around those tables? Um, so specifically around the community engagement element uh, that is listed in uh, the resolution as um, an additional follow-up action. And I think that it'll look a little different depending on um, the agency that engages in that work. All right, wonderful. I know I said that was the last question, but we're still getting so many. Do you have time for just one more? <laughs> I do. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, the legislators that voted against this bill, were there any common characteristics such as party affiliation, part of the state gender? I try not to make this political. Um, I'm going to try and continue to do so. Although I will say there was one uh, Republican that did vote in favor of the resolution, it, either one or two, I believe, but otherwise they were all Republicans. And I was... I am someone who considers myself to be bipartisan. Uh, I reach across the aisle and much that I do. And so I did call the lead Republican and ask, um, particularly when this was just in committee, what is the problem with the resolution? I figured this would be something we could all agree on because it is just a simple acknowledgement of the fact that this exists. And the explanation that I received was plainly, they do not believe this is a problem that they do not see how uh, racism exists in our systems and structures. Uh, and furthermore, they do not believe that policymakers uh, and the governing body is responsible for correcting this. And so to me, that says a whole lot about the people that they represent, number one, um, because the people they represent allow them to take that stance, which is part of why uh, you know allies and community outreach is critical. Uh, but then number two, we're, we will have to be very strategic about the approach that we take and follow up actions to actually execute on the solutions and the recommendations that will go towards rectifying this problem. Um, but it is not, it was not intended to be political in nature, but that ultimately was how the break, the vote broke down. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We do have a few remaining questions, but we'll do our best to follow up and answer those following the webinar. And again, this, pre this recording and these presentations will be available after the webinar, as well as um, a link to the resolution for you to review as well. So thank you so much for your time today, Delegate Aird. It was truly an honor to have you with us, and we're looking forward to hearing about future steps for legislation related to this resolution. Thank you, Rebecca. And I will just say that if individuals would like a response from me directly, please feel free to email my state email. It's available online. And thank you for the opportunity to participate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay. I now have the honor of introducing Cynthia Hudson, Chair of the Commission to Examine Racial Inequity in Virginia Law. Cynthia Hudson is an accomplished attorney bringing over 20 years of experience as a local and state government level practitioner and litigator to her current position at Sands Anderson Legal Firm. Prior to joining Sands Anderson, Cynthia served as the Chief Deputy Attorney General for the Commonwealth of Virginia. She also spent eight years as City Attorney General for the Commonwealth of Virginia, or excuse me, the <laughs> City Attorney for Hampton, Virginia, and is proceeding in the preceding seven years as Hampton Deputy City Attorney. 
In addition to currently serving as the gubernatorial appointed chair of the commission to examine racial inequity in Virginia law, her community service includes, but is not limited to, serving as the appointed co-chair of the Governor's Commission on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion from 2017 to 2019, appointed member of the Board of Visitors for the College of William and Mary, membership in the NAACP, and the Hampton Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Among her many recognitions, she was the Oliver Hill Civil Rights Leader Awardee by the Richmond Chapter of the NWACP in 2018, and an inductee of the into the first class of influential women of law by the Virginia Lawyers Weekly in 2019. Thank you so much for joining us today, Chairwoman Cynthia Hudson. Good afternoon. It is my absolute pleasure to be with you today and to take part in this critically important conversation. Um, thank you for holding it and for allowing me to be a part of it. Um, by way of uh, my diversity, uh, introduction. I identify as a cisgendered Black female um, who was a child of um, the rural areas of the state of Virginia, um, Southside Virginia, Nottoway County, um, youngest of seven, um, born uh, in a family where my siblings and I were first generation college attendees who um, probably never even dreamed that any of us would go to professional school. And uh, with the understanding that whatever I've been able to do in, in life in that regard uh, is as a result of someone else having shouldered civil rights fights for me, uh, I feel a personal obligation to pick up the mantle and carry it uh, into the future for my child and my grandchildren. Um, with that said, uh, I know the expectation is that I speak about the, again, I'll call it critically important work of the Governor's Commission to examine racial inequity in the law. It seems that this commission came to greater attention just in the last year or so since the murder of George Floyd and the various other um, police involved um, killings of, of people of color. But actually this commission was born way prior to that in actually June of 19, which uh, many of you may recall followed upon um, significant uh, racially divisive issues that arose in state government by some of our most uh, prominent statewide government leaders at the time. And at that time I was chief deputy attorney general, um, second in command at the AG's office when those issues arose. I lived them, I breathed them uh, and understand and appreciate that this commission which uh, was brought into existence by Governor Northam in the wake of that, um, that, that those statewide government issues exists as a result of that. And it, it, it reminds me that out of um, great distress and division sometimes come some of the best products for fixing the problems that brought them about. And I would say that that is exactly the case with this commission. Um, we are charged by the governor. There are nine of us. I believe we are all um, lawyers or either sitting judges or former Commonwealth attorneys or retired judges uh, who, who have some experience in examining Virginia's statutory law, which is what we are charged to review. Uh, firstly, for absolute clear and express uh, enactments um, by the Virginia General Assembly over decades and decades of expressly racially discriminatory segregationist Jim Crow laws. Um, and I think during that work in, 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 in 2019, which culminated in our first report issued in December 19, some thought that, well, you're dealing with acts of assembly, uh, that while they are you know, technically still on the books are really ineffective in that they have certainly been rendered uh, or nullified by subsequent 
legislation, such as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act uh, of 1965, and by changes in the Virginia Constitution and by interpretations of the federal constitution, such as that in Brown v. Board of Education, that have effected a, a, a 180 degree change from the structure that those acts of assembly set up. Yet, when you look at those acts, which are the acts that created the infrastructure that was Jim Crow, the infrastructure that was massive resistance, and you understand that they are there as existing acts of assembly, we saw, and the governor agreed, that there was much healing to be done and having the General Assembly right here today and right now look again at those laws and expressly and affirmatively reject them by repealing them so that the acts of assembly read from when enacted to the present day reveal the evolution in Virginia public policy around race. Um, I cannot tell you while you know, all of us know academically that schools, not just in Virginia, but pretty much everywhere were desegregated, excuse me, were segregated during that time and, and segregated by law that, uh, that, that places of public accommodation and public transport transportation systems were segregated by law, but to actually open one of the official acts of assembly or collections of acts of assembly and see the crafting of the words that dictate that and that make it a crime, for instance, for a conductor on a train at that time to permit a black person and a white person to sit in the same car or risk criminal prosecution, to see the words in legislative type that say, colored children shall not attend schools within the same classrooms as white children or variously described as Negro children. And, and to see those public policies expressly stated and then to realize as I know now as an adult that someone, 140 someones had to actually develop those policies and write those words and argue in support of them, probably not very strenuous arguments at the time since they were widely accepted and passed, that just as the, the resolution declaring race a public health crisis that Delegate Ayer just spoke of was voted on and debated in that same way, so were these structural components, these public policies that we now still suffer from in communities of color. These vestiges of that time and of those laws continue to affect our lives today in ways that create disparities in all manner of, of, of areas of existence that, that, that are critical to equity and to a respectful existence among other persons in, in the Commonwealth. So while we were certainly, certainly uh, delighted and, and, and honored to have the governor accept all of our recommendations for the repeal of over 90 acts of assembly that, as I said, were the building blocks of Jim Crow and massive resistance, we didn't stop there. Our charge was broader. That addressed the past. We are charged also with looking at present day uh, statutory law in Virginia, which you would not expect, and indeed it does not, expressly differentiate in terms of the application of public policy on the basis of race. But with the understanding that there are laws and constructs and policies that may subtly do that, whether intentionally or not, or indirectly do that, whether intentionally or not, we were charged with sussing that out and proposing recommendations to address the disparities that are created by those, 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 those unstated uh, differences in the application of pol public policy on the basis of race. And with that, we were incredibly, incredibly honored to issue our second report um, or, or for the governor to issue it on our behalf in uh, February of this year and to include in that report, 
recommendations, policy recommendations, many of which have actually in some form or fashion become law, whether it relates to uh, policing reform, whether it relates to housing, educational, education, criminal procedure and general criminal uh, justice beyond policing reform, health reform, environmental justice, and agricultural equity. In a report of over 100 pages, we made policy recommendations in each of those areas that we then passed on to the governor for his consideration in sponsoring bills to effectuate them and to address the disparities in those areas that we described as the vestiges of the acts that the General Assembly repealed uh, in 2019 at our behest or at the governor's behest. Um, but we, and we're not stopping there. And if anyone has not seen that report, I definitely urge you to visit the website of the Governor's Commission to examine racial inequity in the law and, 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 and review it. I think it is a roadmap to uh, social activism in support of racial justice in, 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 in Virginia and, and elsewhere. One of our recommendations I'm so pleased to see was captured in uh, Delegate Aird's resolution, House Joint Resolution 537, when she recommended, or when the, rather the resolution recommended among uh, five different actions that the commission become a, a, a permanent structure in uh, in the Commonwealth. We also recommended that whether this commission continued to exist or not, that the General Assembly begin to employ as a part of its legislative process, the formal act of reviewing every bill for its equity impact, just as it presently reviews every bill formally for fiscal impact. And we'll continue to push for those things. But, but we're moving on with our charge. We are now in phase three of the work. We had our first meeting of 2021 following the uh, General Assembly session conclusion. And next on our agenda, I talked to you about education, health, housing, criminal justice. We're now tackling reforms that we would like to propose that create the economic wealth gap uh, between persons of majority and minority status. So we're looking at state tax reform. We're looking at uh, consumer protection issues. We're looking at contracting. We're looking at real estate issues and and matters of inheritance of, of or purchase of, of, of land that passes along without being subject to a will that might have belonged to uh, minority families that that um, that they don't continue to enjoy the, the generational wealth that that, that, that that might come from that. Uh, and, and we are inviting all comers who wish to participate in this very public process. We are a public body. Uh, there is public notice of our meetings. Everyone is welcome to attend, to comment, and to add to the conversation as we continue to try to develop still more significant uh, public policy recommendations that are aimed specifically at correcting these continued effects of past and present discrimination on the basis of race and ethnicity. Sorry about that, I was muted. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia, so much for joining us and uh, sharing the incredible work the commission is doing. It was so exciting to hear about the actions and recommendations that you guys have taken already um, and the recommendations that have been made for the future and what you guys are gonna be doing from here on out. It's just such an incredible work. So we truly thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I did have a question. Um, you made reference to the report that it was public. Do you have a link to that report and also to the meeting dates and times? I we set the dates of the meeting at each meeting, uh, okay. and we are now circulating some choices for dates in early uh, in, in mid May to okay. the membership. And once that date is set, we'll we'll post it. I will send you a link to both the website where the meeting dates uh, will be posted as they're set, and which also contain a link to the to both reports, uh, both the 2019 report and the one that was issued in February. Um, I, I know that the governor's office had printed copies at one time available of the 2019 report that chronicled the work uh, under which the various Jim Crow and Massive Resistance Acts of Assembly were repealed. Uh, the second report, um, which is significantly longer, presently exists only in digital form. So I will 
but I will send you a, a glad to send a link to that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. If I hang on, I'll, I'll probably post it in the chat and you can, can, can pull it from there. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. And uh, Cynthia will be staying with us through the webinar. So we'll be taking questions for her at the end of the webinar in the Q&A session. Okay, so next we are pleased to welcome Chloe Edwards and Councilwoman Tina Stevens to talk about next steps for advocates. Chloe Edwards is a policy analyst of Voices for Virginia's Children. She leads policy and advocacy work in domains related to the social determinants of health with a focus on healthcare, family economic security, trauma-informed care and equity. In 2020, Chloe launched Virginia's first Racial Truth and Reconciliation Week, which was recognized by Governor Ralph Northam. Now the initiative has evolved into a campaign that empowers the voices and experiences of marginalized communities and acknowledgement of truth to promote healing, reconciliation, and justice. In implementation, Chloe shapes the campaign's policy priorities and provides support to the coalition. During the 2021 uh, GA session, General Assembly session, Chloe helped lead efforts to successfully recognize racism as a public health crisis in Virginia, making the state the first in the South. Prior to Voices, Chloe served as director of Connecting Hearts to solve Virginia's child welfare crisis. In 2021, she was recognized by the Valentine, Valentine as a Richmond history maker for the social justice category. In 2020, she was named on Style Weekly's Top 40 Under 40. She also received the Outstanding Service Award from Connecting Hearts in 2018 and was named Radio One Richmond's Top 30 Under 30 in 2017. Chloe holds a Master's of Public Policy and Leadership from Liberty University and has also completed the Minority Research and Law Institute program at Southern University and the University of Virginia's Sorensen Institute for Political Emerging Leaders program in 2019. Chloe currently serves as the founder of Chloe Edwards Incorporated and president of Black Lives Matter 804. Councilwoman Tina Stevens serves on the town council for Stevens City and is the founder and executive director of the I'm Just Me movement. On the town council, she serves as the chair of the Parks and Recreation Committee and is a member of the Ordinance and Governance and, Political and Public Works Committees. The I'm Just Me movement Tina founded engages youth in engages youth involved in the juvenile court system to establish a program of change in the young person's life. Her distinctions in this role include certified family peer recovery special, specialist and youth support, board of counseling registered to practice as a peer recovery specialist, name and parent action network for advanced parent leadership, trained forensic peer support specialist and suicide assist trained. I now welcome Chloe and Councilwoman Tina to um, take over. It's all yours. Hi, thank you for um, welcoming us and welcome Councilwoman Stevens. I know you are a busy woman, so we appreciate your time today. Um, before we get started, uh, we had started off with diversity welcomes. I gave an example earlier, but the goal of this welcome is to really talk about, um, just shed light on what informs uh, what we bring to our work, our personal experiences and identities, whether seen or unseen. So I'll um, give you an example. Uh, my name is Chloe Edwards. I was born in Richmond, Virginia. I'm a cis black woman, the daughter of a single woman, grew up in a middle-class neighborhood that um, experienced poverty so that we could gain access to a good education. And I also have personal experience of Virginia's foster care system through kinship care. So I'll pass the mic to you just to um, briefly uh, touch, shed light on your identities and we welcome you here today. Are you, I'm sorry, are you asking uh, the group or are you asking me? I'm sorry, I just wanted to follow. Sorry, you, uh, Councilman Stevens. Okay. Um, so yes, um, thank you again for having us and thank you, um, Chloe, for your great work and everyone. I mean, it really takes all of us to make a difference um, in change and you can't, um, you can't uh, make change for those things that you don't acknowledge. Um, so uh, as uh, was shared earlier before, I am um, a councilwoman. I am a person that has lived experiences uh, with trauma, but I'm also someone that has identified that uh, trauma is does not define who I am and that I can be my own hopes, dreams, and aspirations. Um, I live in Winchester, Virginia, and I have six children, two by birth and um, four uh, children that were uh, through an adoption process through Fairfax County uh, Foster Care and Adoption. And I have a positive outlook on life and 
um, you know, I'm, I'm very inclusive. Thank you. We appreciate that. So we are here to talk about local level advocacy. And I know you have a specific example of a, the local resolution for racial truth and reconciliation week in Stephen City. Um, but I'll open up first and just talk about um, on a broader perspective, advocacy and engagement, and then your specific example um, will serve as um, kind of a case study uh, so that people can analyze what those tips look like in practice. So I'm glad that we all talked about our personal experiences and what brings us to this work and what informs our work because when it comes to advocacy or activism or organizing, it is personal. And that's what makes us passionate about all of the work that we do. We had um, an advocacy cohort that also you served on as well, Councilman Stevens. And uh, we led the charge on um, legislation, including racism as a public health crisis, the declaration, but also economic supports and expanding kinship care supports in the General Assembly and looking at kind of that continuum of care so that we can dismantle racism from a multi multidisciplinary uh, perspective. So with that being said, when it comes to local level advocacy, it first starts with developing your target demographic. Is your issue at the federal level? Do we need to uh, have conversations with, uh, such as the president of the United States or the House of Representatives or the Senate? Is it on a smaller scale at the state level where you're targeting um, the governor, uh, the House of Delegates and the Senate? Or is it at the local level where it's something really close to your community and you may wanna reach out to your mayor or your city council or your board of supervisors? So you first need to kind of identify the scale of your issue and then you can start analyzing the map and who has the power to ignite the change that you are trying to accomplish. When it comes to local advocacy, something to keep in mind is that local authority varies and so you may need to closely analyze whether it's a policy or a budget item to um, look at who can have the largest impact when it comes to the scope of your issue. The budget is op often proposed in January or February, but it's finalized in May. Um, most have budget hearings in March or April. Um, and then we also encourage you to get involved in local planning initiatives so you have greater insight on what conversations you can um, tune into to have more get you closer to decision making power. Note that with COVID-19 there the budget has been very different because of the economic impact. So you may need to look out for some emergency hearings or um, uh, changes to the budget that is being made. For state level advocacy, some things to keep in mind is that we have a one term governor here in Virginia. The budget is biannual, proposed by the outgoing governor, and then the next governor adopts the budget of the predecessor. We have a part-time legislator that serves 60 days in even years most often and 30 or 45 days in odd years. This is outside of a special session um, when we're, for example, getting federal funding, we often go into a, a special session to look at how that funding will be used in Virginia. And so uh, the legislature will convene um, outside of normal times when that occurs. An example of that would be the August special session where we looked at criminal justice reforms but COVID-19 interventions. And then um, the, the most success, successful bill or budget is, is often bipartisan as Delegate Aaron was talking about where you have House and Senate support uh, regardless of the party identity. And then for federal advocacy, um, you may participate in town hall meetings. You can go to Google Find Your Legislator um, where you can uh, identify your state and your federal public officials. Um, can always connect to national networks to gain insight on expertise. And then um, there's often at the federal level ongoing budget uh, cycles that are typically finalized in September. There's numerous ways to advocate. You can provide testimony at hearings or local meetings. You can invite public officials to attend your events, um, such as events like this. Often if it's um, 
general assembly advocacy, sometimes it's more effective on the off season to build a relationship. You can attend advocacy days, you can engage with your social media, and then you can connect with organizations like NAACP or Southerners on the ground or a local Black Lives Matter chapter. When communicating, just be mindful that people may not always agree with your issue as Delegate Aird mentioned. So always keep the conversation positive, keep it short, tie it to a solution and personalize it with your story in a clear stance. I support, I suppose, I want you to support or I want you to oppose. And so with all of that being said, I'll um, pass the mic to you, Kevin Steven, to some background, Voices is also home to the Racial Truth and Reconciliation Virginia campaign, which was launched through Racial Truth and Reconciliation Week. Um, it's an initiative that looks at policy, advocacy, and justice to uplift the voices and experience of those impacted by oppression. So Councilwoman Stevens took it a step further and did a local resolution in Stephen City and will walk us through some of the steps she took to make that resolution successful. Thank you so much. So I'll first start by saying we always look for, or I always did look for, who is the best person that could do this? You know, even prior to becoming a councilwoman, I just thought there's some change that we need here locally, but like who could do it? So I was always searching to see who was equipped, who might have all of the credentials that could be needed. And someone simply said to me, well, why don't you run? You know, it, it, it didn't dawn on me. Here I am, you know, an activist in my community. I'm, you know, uh, organizing uh, marches, you know, you know, for social justice and such, you know, the, the um, George Floyd, uh, you know, incidents really sparked a lot here. So I was on the ground with that. But someone simply said, well, there's an opening, so run. So I say the first step is, you know, knowing what's available in your locale. There are tons of opportunities to get involved on the local levels. Um, and, and as Chloe uh, mentioned before, you know, sometimes, you know, people want to, you know, have those actionable things at the top level, you know, with the big, where the big scene is. But I'm a firm believer that, you know, on the local level is really where the work can really cultivate and grow. And so, you know, first knowing the availabilities on different um, boards and councils and opportunities to get involved. Uh, so with that being said, um, you know, having that spark to get on council was number one. Number two was believing that I could actually do it, that it wasn't rocket science to be able to, you know, bring my skills and have some representation. Um, I was especially inspired by Delegate Aird's um, resolution. And at that time, I just thought, what can I do? What can I do here to make a difference? What can I do here? Um, so in our town, our small little town, we are doing a lot of great things right. And a lot of people don't know about, you know, those great initiatives that we do have going on. But I want it to be intentional. Although we are doing great things already, I wanted there to be a way that we could recognize um, that, you know, racism, you know, is a public health crisis, which is part of what my, uh, you know, my stance was in, in presenting this to town council was um, right now there's a lot going on and we need and we got a lot of great things right let's make sure that we are more intentional and let's make sure that we are protecting the town and letting know, letting our constituents know, um, you know, where we actually stand when it comes to racism. And so I thought, okay, well, if Delegate Arid can create this wonderful resolution, um, you know, declaring racism as a public health crisis, then I could put something together at least, you know, it may not be exactly the pieces that I need. So I took pen to paper and I just started writing everything I could think of in terms of what I would want as a citizen to protect me and a town. So um, with that being said, I started to gather some information about Virginia's history, um, you know, so I added some, you know, some of those uh, intricate pieces to it. And I, I definitely wanted to put a personal touch on it as well. So, you know, I wanted to make sure that people knew that, you know, we were not going to stand for dis discrimination in any kind, shape or form. So, you know, we add, I added those specific pieces. Um, I said, you know, we will not, um, discriminate based on, you know, race, color, 
gender, sexual orientation, or national origin. And I wanted to include everyone because there's so many topics and hot topics, even with immigration, um, you know, here in our town. Will we cooperate with ICE if they came to our town? Would that be discrimination if we did that? Um, so I specifically added those pieces there. What about people that identify as LGBTQ? How would they feel in our wonderful town, you know, you know, if they were discriminated against? And, and what would we do if that was to happen? So I, put, I did uh, make sure that we had some specific specific verbiage that said, if this happens in our town, then we will use every resource to make sure that we will combat it, address it. And um, so I'm passionate about this and I could go on and on, but I, that spark was already there. But when Delegate Ariad did what she did, I was like, okay, I'm a little old person, but I, I do, I do have some activism, but I also know that uh, trauma is, um, community-based, catastrophic, uh, childhood, um, you know, adverse childhood experiences, and culturally. And so I know that um, as a trauma practitioner, um, the cultural pieces is, is something that I, I truly identify with. So I will stop there, but I will say that it starts, starts with you. It starts with you wanting to get involved. It starts with you identifying that you have a purpose, even in your own town, and that you can, um, you can make change by doing simple things. Thank you. So the target for this resolution was really the, uh, did you work solely with the city council or did you have to work with the uh, board of supervisors as well? Um, so it was, a, it was, a, it was my council. Uh, so I simply had some reservations as well because some of the things that I put in the resolution or was suggesting, I was like, oh, if I put this, they may say no. If I put that, they may say no. And then I just thought, no, I really firmly believe this in all of this. And I, um, it, it was unexpected. You know, we have a very diverse board uh, uh, and we are, um, we are bipartisan. But um, so I presented it and I said, you know, I have a resolution. I'd like you guys to review it. Um, you know, let's talk about some changes if necessary. But, um, and they said, well, we're doing this already. And I said, but we've got to be intentional. We need to be intentional. And um, to my surprise, um, there was one minor uh, change that was suggested, but they agreed. They agreed that these were all important things and to protect our town and to protect everyone and to let them know that they are included, they are wanted and they are protected. Um, and that we would be um, very uh, vigilant about discrimination. Um, I just said, I'd like you guys to accept and vote it in, kind of. And they're like, yes, I was totally surprised. I didn't expect it. I didn't have one no. Because really, I mean, I think as we see things on the news and we see things that are going on globally, you know, some of these topics, you know, are not just our little town, they're everywhere. Um, and to my surprise, there's now three locales that have adopted uh, this resolution. Um, and I'm really excited about that. So yes, it was just our council that we had to, um, to present to, uh, that I had to present to, and then they uh, voted it in. So it was just that simple. And what's the uh, name of the resolution in those localities if folks want to, to find them? Um, it is just the, the resolution for equality and equity. Um, and so ours has Stephen, Stephen City, uh, but Middletown, Virginia has now uh, adopted it. They are fully, um, they've fully implemented that. And um, uh, the other is Front Royal, which has been in the news for quite a, some hot topics there. So uh, they are also considering the resolution as well, but, um, and they've made no changes. They've, I, I've, given them the option to adopt it as it is uh, or to make changes. And they have not made any changes and they've adop uh, they have adopted it as is, which says that, you know, they are on the progressive um, route to making change and that, you know, my little old idea worked. So thank you. Like, De like uh, Delegate Eric said, a lot of times while resolutions are symbolic, but that first step is really diagnosing or defining the issue. So kind of the lesson we want to propose here is that 
if other folks are interested in taking a lead at the local level where communities can really, really feel that kind of impact as thinking through steps for local advocacy um, and how you can be leaderful and, and getting folks on board to, to craft something similar in your communities. Um, and then further taking it a step to target your city council or your mayor who, who can also support resolutions as well. Some examples of ways to uh, mobilize support if you don't wanna to take charge all on your own and wanna be more impactful is um, you can, like uh, Councilman Stevens does, engage in your communities um, to get at the hearts of what should be in there. You can connect with advocacy or, or justice organizations near you. You can um, uh, start a coalition in your community and uh, work towards the common go together. So those are just a few examples, but um, Voices has advocacy tools on our resource on our resource page at vakids.org. And I'd gladly share that uh, resolution information to anyone that would uh, love to have it. And I encourage you to present it uh, to your locales. You know, you never know. Well, thank you for your time today. And we'll pass the mic back to Rebecca or Kim. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Councilwoman Stevens, I know your time is short. You're, um, you're very busy. So I'll kick it off with a question for you. Um, the audience is interested in hearing your perspective on how local public health and medical professionals in your area could be beneficial or supportive in your work to support racial justice and health policy. Um, I think the main thing is staying informed, you know, staying informed about the needs of our community. Um, I personally um, think that you know there's always work to be done and you know keeping your finger on the pulse to see you know what the needs are of your communities um our our specific needs in our communities are broadband you know and and health you know health wise we are trying to get out um the um the information to our communities in terms of vaccinations and we have had some hesitancy with uh, people wanting to get vaccinated. So awareness campaigns and being on the ground to keep them informed about the importance of, um, you know, protecting themselves and their families. Um, but I think that, you know, some of those, uh, some of those things are, they're ongoing, you know, it's not a one-stop shop. And so we are doing you know, lots of great things to be able to keep people informed and to reduce these, um, you know, the inequities that may happen intentionally or, 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 or otherwise. So um, those are some of the things that we're seeing is really the priorities are making sure that people um, get access to health care, but they also get access to vaccinations. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, if you don't have broadband, you don't have you, know, you are not able to access some of the forms that are done electronically. And that's a big deal. It's a gap um, in, in awareness for people that can't access. Uh, I know that you know, we're, we're away from the form of you know, paper, but you know, we've got to make sure that people are connected electronically as well. Thank you. So we have some other questions. Um, so a couple questions from earlier today, Are Virginia legislatures at state and local levels having any discussions about reparations, if anybody can take that one. What was the question again? Are Virginia legislatures at state and local levels having any discussions about reparations? This is Mike, I'm not familiar with any currently, but if someone else is, please feel free to share. I'm not aware of any. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm sure discussions are going on. I'm not aware of formal policy. I'm I am unaware of any in my locale. Well, I was just going to mention that at the federal level, there is the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. So that would be a good first step for folks that are interested in engaging with policy related to rep reparations. Um, and so they are following pieces of legislation at the federal level. So I um, recommend getting in touch with that group. And then there's also the grassroots campaign for reparations. 
um, can pull up the precise website. Um, yeah, grassroots reparations campaign, which is backbone by the Truth Telling Project, who I work with, it was which was born after the um, Mike Brown shooting, and so the. Uh, that's another uh, resource to loop into those conversations. At the local level, there are organizations like Coming to the Table, RVA, for example, who is also a member of that grassroots reparations network too. So if you want to connect with a group working on it at the local level, I'd reach out to them. Thank you. Next question. Um, is approximately how many laws that created the structure of Jim Crow need to be repealed in Virginia? Actually, they, they, they were actively repealed by the 2020 General Assembly. Um, and the Jim Crow laws in combination with the um, massive resistance, the, the, the laws that promoted massive resistance numbered over well over 85 laws um, of acts of assembly. And as I mentioned, and I put, we put the links um, to the commission website in the chat, both reports, both the one um, that details the acts of assembly that we proposed for repeal and that were repealed are set forth there. All right, thank you. Um, Cynthia, I have a question for you. This is from Valerie Hayes. She says, I'm very interested in having you speak to a consortium of clergy and laity in Warren County and Northern Shenandoah Valley, Valley, Frederick and Clark counties to speak about these racial inequity laws and how to change them. You spoke of massive resistance. Warren County was one of those counties and my Episcopal parish was directly involved. Would love to have you speak here. Happy to, we could, I hope my contact information is being shared um, in connection with this presentation. So please just, just reach out and we'll get something set up. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, and we will we'll put your um, contact information in the chat as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. This is for anybody to take. What initiatives will be in place to drive the recognition of this resolution with health systems, particularly for maternal child health for black women? Uh, I can take that question. So voices, um, we've been working on decreasing the maternal infant uh, mortality disparity this past year. Um, we're also a member of the Healthcare for All Virginians Coalition, um, which has which worked on issues uh, like Medicaid expansion, um, expanding programs such as Famous Moms, uh, and et cetera. But uh, this year, there, there were significant investments in expanding healthcare um, to immigrant populations specifically um, related to healthcare disparities when it comes to race and ethnicity. Um, when it comes to maternal infant uh, mortality, there was an investment in increasing uh, doula access care for pregnant women. Um, over, uh, there was $2.4 million invested in that, Medicaid doula providing trainer and resources, um, funding invested in that for FY22. There's also a plan for fetal and infant mortality review teams, which will work on convening a work group to develop a plan to establish um, that team in FY22 as well. There's been a task force for maternal health data and quality measures. So this will examine inequities related to data um, collection, evaluation and outcomes for pregnant women. There was also funding to increase access to substance abuse treatment through the addiction and recovery treatment services art waiver as well, which um, is a um, determinant of health point related to outcomes. But really this has to be kind of analyzed through a multifaceted lens. There's biases in healthcare systems that contribute to disparities in maternal care. Um, there's racism as a public health crisis. There's um, access to um, healthcare in general. There's transportation. So this is a multifaceted uh, issue and there is historical trauma specifically um, in America that we've experienced when it comes to prenatal and maternal care experiments on enslaved um, women, et cetera. Um, 
famous moms this year, uh, particularly expanded access to um, not just prenatal, uh, to prenatal care for immigrant communities, but there are also um, steps that General Assembly has taken when it comes to equitable health care overall to also look at um, health care coverage options for undocumented children um, as well. So there's, I would say, significant investments in, in 2020 specifically. Um, the FAMIS program postnatal care was expanded through FAMIS Moms for Low Income Pregnant Women, which also contributed to that disparity. And then one last point, uh, 40 quarters um, was an, it, it's an example of an implicit, uh, well, an explicitly biased law. It was a law where um, immigrant populations had to have 10 years of work experience in order to qualify for Medicaid. Um, contingent upon federal approval, which just occurred, that law has now been decreased to five years, which will um, expand healthcare coverage for immigrant uh, populations overall. Thank you so much. I see so many more questions coming in, but we have reached time for the webinar. So we We'll um, move forward with just sharing some resources. Many of you requested these resources throughout the course of the webinar. We will certainly follow up with these links so that you can examine the resolution and other reports that were referenced today. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for being here today, for supporting this resolution and future steps we'll take. And of course, thank each of our wonderful speakers for their time and their presentations today. We did have a number of questions that we weren't able to answer, but we will do our best to follow up on those questions and get them answered for you. The last thing I'll mention is that this was just the first webinar in a series of four. We have three additional webinars coming up in June, August, and October that will continue to explore actions um, and the context behind this resolution. I've also included links to all of our websites to find additional resources that were referenced today. So again, thank you for being here. We hope you can join us for future webinars and thank you to each of our speakers for your time um, and, and all of the efforts and work that you're doing to move important work forward, especially work that is supporting this resolution. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. Yes, thank, thank you everyone. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Thank, Thank you, everybody, you for, for joining us. us.